we're talking about a sick liver making a sick person, very simply. Uh, and, the, and the sick liver takes its message from a sick intestinal tract. So the digestion system then connects to the liver, right? You all know the shin bones connected to the ankle bones connected to the foot bone, right? The old song. Well, the similar thing holds true as it relates to this conduit called our digestive tract in which over the course of living a person will eat, on average, between 10 and 20 tons of food. 10 and 20 tons of food in a lifetime that has to be processed and delivered to the body. The friends have to be absorbed, the toxins have to be removed, and the body's requirement to do that is dependent upon the function of two organ systems. The gastrointestinal system that's more than just a digestive conduit because 70% of the body's immune system is clustered around the digestive system and the liver that's intimately connected by the blood supply to the digestive system. So whatever the digestive system uh, sees and, and, and processes, the liver gets that information. The liver is one of the overworked organs of the 21st century. And as a consequence, you would see in the extreme case on the right, a very sick liver. That's a fatty liver. That We hope never get to that place because that's a, what's called a cirrhotic liver. That's a liver that really can't process anything and generally that person's in a, a threat of a liver transplant. But there are many people well before they get to that point of pathology, they're having chronic liver digestive uh, kind of symptoms. It might be irritable bowel syndrome, it might be fatty foods produce a problem, it might be esophageal reflux disorder, it might be all these kind of things that we have these over-the-counter medications that people try to treat their symptoms, not recognizing that these are manifestations of early warning signs of poor quality diet, poor quality body response, and a body that's in alarm reaction. Next slide. So this is a big diagram that we would show to a medical audience. Don't worry about it. I'm just telling you that we can understand each of the steps and how nutrients are related to the conversion of toxins ultimately to non-toxic materials going through the intestines and liver out the body so that they don't produce an adverse effect. We now know this is called a phase one and phase two detoxification system. We're experts about the enzymes that the body makes to process these toxins. We recognize that there are a whole array of nutrients that are necessary for the activation of both phase one and phase two detoxification systems. We can provide a nutritional product that delivers those nutrients in the proper formulation that's proprietary, that it is the fundamental foundation of the clean program. What does that do? Support the liver to do its proper work. It's not taking over the work of the liver, it's supporting the liver to do what it absolutely wants to do, but it doesn't have the tools to do it properly. When you provide those nutrients in a proper form without toxins, lowering the body burden of the things that ultimately would produce disease, it's amazing what you'll see in those people. Headaches, clarity, the headaches go away, clarity of thinking, uh, foggy brain syndrome goes away, sleep improves, energy level, vitality, they radiate health. It's just a whole manifestation of more than just a placebo effect. It's real physiology working at the cellular level. Next slide. So we published a whole variety of papers in this area going all the way back to 1992. I'm not going to bore you with that, just to say this is our credibility linked to our own statement of fact. Next slide. Uh, this is another member of our group, Dr. Dion Liska, who was in charge of our detox program for a number of years, talking about how these systems work. This article is often cited. This was our first clinical intervention trial that we published in a medical journal showing what happens with patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia when we put them on the clean type program that we can resolve their symptoms in 12 weeks and we know how it influences the liver enzymes that are processing toxins. We're the first group in the world to publish that kind of work. Next slide. And lastly, more recently, we've been able to show that the pH balance of the body has a lot to do with its uh, detoxification ability. So by alkalizing the body, we're able to improve detoxification function and these enzymes that are necessary to get rid of toxins. So we know from facts exactly how this works. Next slide. So how does that all relate then to healthy aging or anti-aging or the feeling good, looking good, being good, compressing sickness, being 90 years and still going back to law school? How does that all work? Well, let me tell you a little bit about this. Next slide. So what we've discovered is what Dan Buettner has been talking about. You've seen this book. You've heard about it. It's really the buzz right now. It's been discussed all around the world. And that is that he visited um, these regions of the world that are associated with high longevity, where there are a lot of centurions. People don't have uh, necessarily access to a lot of medicine, but they somehow live long. And you say, well, they, they got the luck of the draw. They got good genes. Yet when these people with these good genes move to more Western societies within one generation, they have the same disease patterns as people that already live there. So it's not just that their genes alone are protecting them from these diseases. How does that work? Well, what are these blue zones? Blue zones are the regions of the world that were circled with a blue marking pen where you have high prevalence of longevity. 
And they include places like some areas of Costa Rica and areas in the Philippines and areas that, in which you really, uh, uh, Sardinia. But there's one country in this list that's very unusual. It's a country that actually is not a country. It's a city. And it exists in the Los Angeles metropolitan basin within the smog belt. It's connected by the same freeways that, of the rest of LA. The, prob the difference is, however, the people that live in this town called Loma Linda, California, have on average 14 years of reduction of infirmity and seven years longer life. Now you say they must have good genes in Loma Linda. Well, I'm telling you, Loma Linda is a melting pot of all sorts of genealogies. There is not like just one ethnicity in Loma Linda. What is unique about Loma Linda? Because they breathe the same air, drink the same water, travel the same freeways. Turns out they're Seventh-day Adventists. Now what are Seventh-day Adventists? Those are people who eat, drink, think, and live differently. They have vegetarian lifestyles. They have um, minimalist concepts about uh, alcohol and caffeine and stimulants. Uh, they, they have a certain belief about exercise, about vitality and they know how to have the principles that are associated with the same people that live a kind of similar uh, along with people that live in Costa Rica or the Philippines or Sardinia. So what are those characteristics? Well, there's a, what, Dr., uh, what Dan Buettner talks about, nine different characteristics that associate long life, right? Which, uh, uh, stop eating when you're 80% full, don't overeat. Uh, you eat more plants, right? Stay away from a lot of animal products. Uh, red wine is probably good, a little bit of consistency, uh, but in moderation. Um, plan to be, know your purpose in life, have a spiritual belief system, downshift, know how to work at the right rhythm, not overwork, but properly work. And when you do work, have value in that and feel good about it. Uh, move all the time. You know, those legs are on the end of your uh, torso for a reason other than to hold pants and skirts. So, you know, use this for activity. And belong to a healthy social network and have a family. It doesn't have to be your biological family. It's your tribe. It's people you affiliate with that you, you draw support from. These are characteristics that are associated with long life. Now, with all of that in mind, let's look at a good friend of mine, Rick Weinrich, at the University of Wisconsin. Now, you might say, I've just jumped, haven't I, very strongly from uh, humans living in a tribe to primates living in a research facility. But what I want you to see with your own eyes are these two animals. Um, animal A and B is one animal, and animal C and D is another animal. Now, if you look at those pictures without being a primatologist, I think you immediately say, well, these animals look like they're different in age, right? Wouldn't you say that? Like you would say the animal on the left, I would believe, looks a lot more gerontological than the animal on the right. Now, I'm going to tell you these are brothers and sisters. Th these are from the same litter. These have the same age. Now, you say, well, what's going on? Why the one on the left looks so aged? versus the one on the right. Because the one on the left was fed the ad lib primate chow diet. The one on the right was fed a, a special diet, which was calorie restricted, but not nutrient restricted. It got plenty of vitamins and minerals and the good stuff we need without extra calories. This is called calorie restriction. It's the only known way previously to improve longevity in animal species. It hasn't been proven yet totally in humans, but in everything now up through primates, meaning monkeys, it's shown that if you reduce calories by 20 to 30 percent without reducing vitamins and minerals, that you increase longevity by up to 33 percent. Now, if you had the pill that could do that, you would be a trillionaire, right? And what we say is, we have the tools right now. We don't need a pill. The tool is the proper construction of diet and lifestyle. Now, with that in mind, let me go to the next concept. And that is, we look at the difference in mortality of these two groups of animals, same birthdays when they were born, Look at what happens to them. The red lines are the calorie-restricted animals. That's the percent still alive over years of living versus the blue line, which is the percent still alive, eating the normal old ad-lib, whenever you want to have a snack, go ahead, type diet. Now, it doesn't take a st statistician to look at that and say, there's something going on there, right? Wouldn't you rather be on the red line than the blue line? Of course you would. So what we're really saying is this concept of detoxification and clean and, and calorie management and nutrient density has a lot to do with how your genes express themselves throughout your life to give not just momentary vitality, but long-term payoff, reduced morbidity, reduced sickness, and improved longevity. Next slide. Now, that is a concept. You've all seen this, right? This is the big thing in the news. This has helped to give a, a huge burgeon to the red wine industry. Uh, now everyone's saying, well, when I drink wine, I'm getting this French paradox principle called resveratrol. And resveratrol improves longevity. So now supplements of resveratrol have, have skyrocketed. 
Well, I happen to know personally the founder of the company that was made this discovery, uh, the company discussed on this uh, recent Fortune magazine paper. Next slide. And this is the kind of data that they presented in a very scientific paper saying that resveratrol, when it is consumed at high levels in animals, can extend life expectancy like if the animals were put on a calorie restricted diet. So everyone said, oh, this is great. Now I don't have to restrict my calories. I can just take a lot of resveratrol. Yes. However, however, and this is the important however, the amount of resveratrol that was given to these animals, if equivalent to a human dose, a human dose would have to be about 30 to 50 grams a day. The amount that is provided by nutritional supplements, generally, these high price nutritional supplements, is about 30 to 100, maybe as many as 200 milligrams. That would be a fairy pixie dust amount of resveratrol relative to what we're fed these animals, meaning you're not going to get it. There's no way. This has been a way over exaggerated. But there's still something of interest here, isn't there, that suggests that there are certain principles in food when combined together in the right symphonic orchestration produces a symphony that might improve longevity and reduce sickness. Now with that in mind, this is the kind of backlash that we've seen recently to resveratrol the hard sell of anti-aging, saying, guys, you're being ripped off. If you're out there trying to buy a resveratrol supplement to extend your life, you're, you're way off the mark in understanding how this really works. There's something to the story, but it's not just taking your 100 milligrams of resveratrol a day. Now with that in mind, next slide, we in Metaproteomics Metagenics have been involved in research over the last few years and have made a discovery, which I think is quite remarkable. We have discovered within foods a certain principle that when tested in the same model that the resveratrol is tested, has the effect of extending life expectancy and the reduction of insulin and the improvement of body mass and the reduction of body fat. In fact, we can feed these animals high fat diets that would normally make them very obese over time. But when we feed them this new principle that we found in foods, at doses that are reasonable, not extraordinary, we're able to neutralize the adverse effects of the high fat diet and maintain their low body weight. Now, how do we do that? because we've stimulated specific ways that our book of life, our genes, respond to create an environment in those genes that doesn't see it in a hostile environment, but say, oh gee, we need to kind of turn up our metabolism to manage that increased calorie load, as you would have done as an animal in the wild eating a natural diet, where you have principles that can regulate your metabolism. Those are the things that we have taken out of our food. I want to go back, I'm going to finish this, my last slide. So what I'm really trying to get you to understand is that Metagenics Metaproteomics has been really working fairly uh, vigorously and, and with high dedication uh, to try to understand the mechanisms that underlie how to eat, what to eat, and in what are conditions we can promote and support proper human metabolism. It's not a mystery. The body wants to be healthy. It doesn't say, hey, I've got the genes for disease. What it says is, I've got the genes for potential for health, but give me the right tools. And what we're starting to learn is what those tools are, how to construct them. We have patent protection on many of our products. We've discovered ways that we can deliver this in meaningful ways to patients that they can comply with. And the CLEAN program is an extraordinary exemplification of the work that we've been doing over the last 30 years. Thank you very much. Wow.